Hi, I'm Dr. Linda Silbert, and welcome to Getting Ready for School. I'm so glad you're here, and I'm so glad I'm here. It should be a fun 45 minutes together. And um, before I begin, though, I actually want to take a few minutes out just to say thank you for taking the time out to join my webinar. Because it says if you actually took time out of your schedule, which I know all of you are teachers or educational directors, you have family, some you're sending off to college, some of your kids are first starting kindergarten, you're getting clothes and school supplies, that you took time out, even from a vacation you may still be on, um, to come to this webinar, then you really do care about teaching. And that is just wonderful. So thank you. Um, secondly, I want to thank you for being a Jewish educator. It's not easy. Teaching in itself is not easy. And um, many of you teach at day schools, and you all know how difficult it is. And many of you are after-school Hebrew school teachers. And that's a true challenge because it starts at 4 o'clock in the afternoon usually when most kids are tired. In fact, research has shown 4 o'clock in the afternoon is when most people are the most tired. So the teachers are tired, the children, um, and yet you're all there. So it's a true challenge. So um, thank you. Thank you for, for doing this. Okay, we're going to begin now. We're going to be learning and you'd be learning by getting ready for school using the strong learning system, which I created. And I created it over the years, I've been teaching and being administrator and so forth for years and years and years. I'm actually a therapist for dyslexia. I was a principal of a Hebrew school many years ago, and I have a private practice for children for counseling. And so um, I see children in all different areas. And so um, as I've been putting all of these things together, I put together the strong learning system. The best part of it is basically free. I mean, there's, there's so many programs out there that cost thousands and thousands of dollars, but you're going to see as they go through it, you really don't have to spend thousands and thousands of dollars. So stay with me. We'll walk through it, and hopefully this will help you and we'll think about this coming year. Uh, because it's been, this whole system is based on what master teachers already know. So if you're a master teacher and you go, I knew that. Uh, good, because it'll validate it. And if you're a brand new teacher or you're just getting your feet wet, hopefully you'll get some some little tips on how to become a master teacher. So how to teach so that all children learn. That's the goal. We're going to begin with number one. The strong learning system begins basically has three parts. And first part, number one, create an environment conducive to learning so that every child feels emotionally and socially safe. Okay, we're going to begin with that. Then we're going to move into part two, which is teach through play and other engaging modalities to make learning happen. And finally, when you see that you have the environment and you're teaching through play and some of these children still aren't learning, there's a challenge there. There's an obstacle. What is happening? Um, part three deals with what do you do? How do you deal with these obstacles and with these challenges? So let's go now to create an environment conducive to learning so that your students feel emotionally and socially safe. Very important fact. Okay, and the fact is that you, you as their teacher, you're one of your students' most important, significant others. Even the teachers in after-school Hebrew schools, the teacher comes in third behind mom and dad. And what this means is when a person develops a feeling of self-worth or self-esteem, it's not always because they have A+, plus or they were the best baseball player. It's a perception of how that child perceives their significant others perceive them. Okay, in a child's life, their most important significant other begins with mom, and that's universal. Dad, right up there with mom, family members, grandma, grandpa, maybe a sibling, but right there, okay, is the teacher. 
The teacher does not know how much power they hold. So it's how the child perceives you perceive them. If they think you think they're great, they're going to feel good. And that goes to point number two. When students perceive their teachers like them, they'll work for those teachers and they'll do well. So what you do and say affects how your students feel about themselves. Pretty powerful. You're up there on a pedestal and it's kind of hard. How do you, how do you deal with this? Um, so use words that count. Thank them, saying, thank you, that was really a great idea. Oh, that was a good try. I'm proud to be your teacher. Instead of saying, I'm proud of what you did, therefore you're judging them. Because they go, okay, suppose I don't do this next time. Suppose I don't get 100. You're not going to be proud of me? Okay, or they don't do well the next time. They Suddenly the whole feeling of self-worth drops because they're going, well, they were proud of me when I got the 100 or the 90. They probably think I'm stupid now. But to say, I'm proud to be your teacher is, comes from a totally different point of view. Okay, next, I always knew you could do it. I always say that to kids when I'm working with them in my private practice. And I go, how did you do that? And you know, you always come through somehow. And they go, you know, I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing. Go, well, whatever it is, it's working. And they feel wonderful. So they will continue wanting to learn and to show you that they're okay, because they now know in my eyes, in your eyes, they're okay. Let your students know that you're their ally and will always be there for them. So therefore, bullet one, be open and available. Be sure they know if they need help, you'll be there for them. Because really, okay, inside, if mom, dad, and the teachers are not there for them and they're learning, who will be there for them? That's it. Okay, next, recognize and applaud their effort. Um, be a good role model by controlling your own temper and anger, and not by being sarcastic or critical. I've seen teachers when I've gone into different classrooms to, you know, or different school environments when, I, when I'm giving lectures, and they, they are sarcastic. They'll answer the child sarcastically. Children don't always get it. They don't think the teachers are always fooling around. It's a child with a child's brain, and they see it. A teacher doesn't like me, okay? And you start losing them there. Okay, be sure your students feel part of the school community. That's really important. When you feel you're part of something, okay? When you feel that you, um, you belong, the family, belonging to the family, belonging to your school, the temple, Okay, so make sure your students feel part of, of the school community. Um, that could be in a whole other website. We just don't have time today to go into the details. But talk to your teachers if you're your educational directors. Um, teachers talk to the educational directors, have meetings. How can you pull the kids in that they, this is their, they're not just attending, going through these doors to walk into this building. This is their community. Also, make sure they feel respected. And I love this little story. I found it years ago when I was the principal in the Hebrew school. I was cleaning out a closet and found a pile of books, you know, that treasure that you find when you're, when you're trying to find things at a synagogue. And all of a sudden there were these books. And I found this story in there. It was much longer than this. But basically, a king is walking with his two sons, and it starts to rain. So the king puts an umbrella over each child's head. And people say to him, you're the king. They should be putting the umbrella over your head. And the king says, how would they learn respect if I don't show respect? And I just think that just says it all. You are the significant other. You are very, very important with a lot of power. So I want you to think about this. Reflect on this. And by the way, this sheet with many other sheets as we go through um, are all at the end of the um, webinar. So at the very end, there'll be something that you click on or whatever um, to download it. And so take the sheet, download it. You can use it at a teacher's meeting. Um, if you're a teacher, again, go to the directors. If you're one of the directors, um, go to the teachers and have it in a meeting. 
I, I don't know if you can see it well, but when you download, it's going to say, think back to your school days, including college. Which teachers can you think of that truly accepted, supported, and respected you? Think about it. It's hard. It's, you, you think, well, I don't know. I never thought about it. So now think about it. And then what did they do? If you think of someone, think about what did they do that showed they really cared about you? And it made you want to learn and it made you really feel good. Um, then think about which teachers um, can you think of that you that did not accept, support, or respect you? Write them down and then what did they do to show you this? It's really an interesting thing because I'll be with children and they could be in fifth, sixth grade. Um, actually, it was a group I had last summer and they were all entering sixth or seventh grade. And they were all children who were dyslexic. And they were there just every would meet uh, for brunch. And I'd have my bagels and cream cheese and, and we all know, brought their own beverage and we would just talk what it's like being dyslexic. And they would talk about things and talk about them. And this teacher said this and this teacher said this and I wanted to punch her. And, I, and I'd say, wow, when that was Lashley's teacher? No, that was in first grade. Every one of them. Another one would say, my first grade teacher was so mean. Or my second grade teacher doesn't go away. It truly doesn't go away. You hold a lot of power. Okay, next. Also, if you're getting ready for school, besides helping the children emotionally and socially, it also helps if you're organized because that reduces stress for you and for the children. Because when you're stressed out because you can't find this, you don't know where this is, you become stressed out and the children become stressed out. Begin by getting a nice yearly calendar. Fill it in with all the holidays, all the special days for Hebrew school, all the special days for um, conferences, and then take that day and walk backwards and put in, and you put in pencil. I never fill out a calendar in ink, always in pencil, because you can always switch it. And put in when you have to begin getting ready. Okay, this way you don't end up a week before or three days before or two days before the class or a day before saying, oh my gosh, tomorrow is poor or tomorrow. Think about it. Fill in when you want to start getting ready and when you want to start thinking about it. So now it just it comes out of your head onto the paper. I know most of you only use electronics. That's fine. I cannot stop using paper because I love to have it in front of me. I take my calendar, I look, I don't have to worry where is it if I'm on the phone and someone asks me, I have my paper calendar in front of me. That's up to you though. Okay, then do a weekly or daily planner. And I have one again that you can download at the very end. And it looks like this. And you download it, fill it out. And when you do this, it starts at 6 a.m. in the morning, then many of you get up, and it finishes at 11. And it goes from Monday right through Sunday. Fill it out. You can use pencil again because you may say, um, okay, we're doing this. Oh, I forgot. No. And your son has baseball practice this time. Fill it out. And you'll see the blank little rectangles that are empty. And you'll realize, oh, I have a lot of time. I have a lot of empty blank rectangles. Or you'll say, wow, everything is filled up. No wonder I feel stressed. I don't have time. I have no time to make up lesson plans. So fill this out. It's good for you. It, and it, it's, it's truly healthy. I had a mom a few years ago who came in, and we filled this whole thing out, and she thought the child needed tutoring. And I was more than happy to help him. If he filled it out, he had one spot. It was on a Thursday night between 6.45 and 7.45 that he was not busy. And we're looking at this, and she's looking at it, and I said to her, the problem is not the tutoring. The problem is he's overbooked. Okay, and that alone just takes away the stress. Start pulling things back, but don't ever take away anything that the child really loves. So um, there's just being more organized. Next, hole punch, binders, and dividers. I'm back with my paper. But even though I'm doing this whole webinar here, 
through electronics and I'm on my computer all day and we're doing Skype and we're doing all these different things, I still have a pile of papers, many piles of papers, and I think you all do. And I'm, I'm always moving from this place to this place, from this place to this place. Go get a hole punch, <laughs> then get your binders, okay, three ring binders, and dividers, those old fashioned dividers. Divide your your um, binders into sections. And so if you're teaching Hebrew, if you're teaching different classes, if you're teaching holidays, divide it up. Take all your papers, things that you created this year, put it in there. So now you have a place for all your papers. If your school can afford it, or maybe the PTA will raise some money, have every child have one. They could carry them through school, all through Hebrew school. When they come back the next year, they just go back to the binder and divide theirs up. It just helps so that they have it with them. It's theirs. You also, buy the one that the front of it has a little um, plastic slot, and you can put in a picture, and it's their binder. It's personal to them. And finally, bin baskets and boxes. Have a lot of them around. Baskets are so pretty. Just fill them up. And baskets are easy to use because when you have to organize things, you don't have to pick up bins and baskets. You don't have to have a cover. Just put things in. They've done research on people putting things away, being organized. If you have to pull out a drawer, open a door, pull up a lid, it may not get done. Okay, did you ever see the, the hampers when they have lids? Usually the laundry's on top of the lid. You have to find things that people can just drop things in. And it'll be much more likely that you'll put things into these bin baskets. Boxes, yes, but boxes usually have covers. The good thing about boxes is they can stack, so it takes up less room. But make sure you label them well. You know what's in every box. Okay, let's go on. Here's our daily planner. Also, to make sure that environment is conducive to learning, be tuned in to your students' needs. Children are just like we are. They, can, they get tired. Then they need to go out and just run. They've been sitting all day. They need some exercise. They may be hungry. They may not feel well. Um, they may just need some, someone to console them because something's happened at school that day, or then something happened in the house that morning, and they're upset. Talk to them. Say, you know, how are you doing today? Do you want to talk about anything? You're not psychiatrists. You're not their psychologists. But you can contact the parent and say, I was concerned today. So-and-so seemed to be a little, a little low. They seemed a little upset. <clears throat> Parents will appreciate it. Um, then reasons why a student may be upset or they may continue struggling in school and you, you're not aware of it. They may have a hearing loss or poor vision. It could be health problems. I had a child years ago who had diabetes, juvenile diabetes, and was really struggling in school, and especially Hebrew school because it was 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And children with diabetes like that, they go slower, they process slower, many of them, not everyone, and they also get tired. And he was exhausted every time he walked in. Um, by the way, parents had never told me. That's another thing. Please, if you see something, contact the parents. Or send something out and say to the parents, is there something we should know about? So we are aware of this. So we know how to deal and how to help your child. Keep in touch with them. Um, the social issues, peer pressure. They may feel intimidated by certain kids in the class or someone's a bully and is bullying them. Or someone may feel they're always being bullied. You, you don't know. Teachers have talked about this. I know one teacher last year, one child bullied the other one continuously and they had to call, have a whole meeting and call on the parents. It happens. Children sometimes can be mean to each other. Don't let it happen in your class because all this will just stop learning. The kids just shut down. Educational issues. And so many times parents or teachers say, did you study? How could you get this? Did you? And they go, yeah. These kids have no idea how to study. And there's another webinar you may be interested in. How do you study? What do you do? And actually to learn things. Um, poor organizational time management skills. That goes back to the bin boxes and baskets. And to your daily planners. 
emotional and home issues, family problems. I mean, you can't, the child who comes from a home that is struggling with any type of family issue, that child's going to have a lot of trouble concentrating. Um, the child may suffer from anxiety or something is happening that is causing anxiety. Phobias, they're afraid to come to school. There's so many things, but please ask your parents to share this with you. And if you're the executive director, the educational director, I mean, please share it with the teacher. The teacher is the one in the classroom with the child. Okay, know your student struggles. This also, there's so many times things are happening and kids are struggling because they have dyslexia. Well, if they have dyslexia, how are they going to learn to read Hebrew? I mean, it's, it's reading. It's the same thing. Um, a writing disorder. They, they could have math disorder. You won't deal with this unless you're in a day school. But they may have a math disorder. Um, and then find out. And if you see something and no one has ever said anything about it, contact the teacher, uh, the um, parent. Or if you're, um, or contact your educational director. Um, expressive and receptive language disorders, ADD, ADHD. Um, and I have grandma, grandpa, mom, and dad because all these are inherited. Usually they are inherited. And so parents will always say, oh, gee, I struggle so with that. Yeah, I know what that is. Use your parents, call them in, include them. Okay, here's another download when you get to the end. This is interesting. You could do this the first day of school. Give one to every child. They'll fill in all it is, is their name, the date of birth. Um, three things I like, they fill in, and three things I do not like. And tell them I don't care about spelling. It makes no difference to me. Spell it any way you want. You will see immediately. First of all, you'll have children go, what? What'd you say? What do I do? You see the ones that you can listen. It could be a receptive language. It could be an intentional issue. They could be hungry or tired whatever it is, and don't say, oh, you weren't listening. Mark it down that that child asked, and the next time, you know, they asked again. What do I do? Okay. You'll see the ones who put down, um, you'll see the handwriting, by the way, immediately. And if they can't write in English, they're going to have a problem in Hebrew school. You'll see the ones who put down, I hate school, I hate school, I hate school. You'll see the ones who put down, I don't like work, I don't like reading, I don't like math. You'll know immediately. Um, I had a little girl years ago who put down, <laughs> I do not like my sister, I do not like my sister, I do not like Heather. And I said, who's Heather? She's my sister. So we knew we weren't going to contact the sister who was two years older um, if we needed help for this little girl. Those, these little things like that, children talk. They let you know and listen, listen to them. Okay, now we finished creating an emotional and social environment that's conducive to learning. Okay, I'm going to move on. Let's make learning happen now. Okay, now we have the environment. Before I move on, I have to share this little story. I just, I did not pick this up in one of the books. I just heard it over the years. And it just, it's so apropos to this. We just talked about this emotional piece, right? So now this mouse goes to the psychiatrist because he's afraid of the cat. And he tells the psychiatrist, I'm just so afraid the cat's going to get me. And the psychiatrist builds him up. He goes, oh, you're this very strong, clever mouse. You are wonderful. Don't worry about it. You are going to be safe. You are fine. Mouse walks out, feels great. His significant other thinks he's terrific. He feels terrific. Walks out, cat gets him. What happened here? The significant other gave him inflated self-esteem, okay? So he had the self-esteem. He felt good, but the significant other had to continue and teach him how to get away from the cat. He had to learn what to do to get away from the cat. So that's why now we finished the emotional piece. We're moving on now to learning. How do we learn? I put together an acronym, L-E-A-R-N. L, find the level of the child. E, how to engage the child. A, activate or rehearse and end neural change. Here's what this is. Let's begin with the level. Start at the level of the child. Okay, now you're in Hebrew school. How do you know? 
I mean, you suddenly start teaching prayer. You suddenly start doing conversation. Child may not know the letters. They may not know the vowels. They may have learned them when they were six, seven, eight, but they may have forgotten them. And some of the schools aren't even starting the whole thing until later on, when they're a little older. Even at that point, you've got to find out what did they pick up over the years? What do they know? Where do I begin? So, again, here's another downloadable. Just go directly here, and you can download this assessment. I, as you see, it, there's part that faces the child, and then there's part that faces you. And you'll see immediately what they know. Okay, and you'll know if you are using our card games, and many of you are because a lot of you signed up for this because you bought them and you found out about the webinar. Um, each letter, each sound, all these different things, whether it's vowels, whether it's the alphabet, whether it's one syllable word, wherever the child starts having trouble, that's the card game. And it shows you directly this is what you pick up. If you're not using the card games and it shows, okay, they still need practice with their letters and you have games in your class, anything, use that. But you know what each child needs. Um, and that goes to the E and learn engage. Engage, use material that will engage the child. Research has shown when children play, they are more likely to learn than if they're not playing. First of all, when you're playing, you're engaged. Okay, If you're not engaged, you will learn nothing. If you're sitting and the teacher's talking and talking, so many people say to me, yeah, I, I want to learn how to teach. That's not what you need. You have to learn how to teach so the child learns. That's your goal is the learning. Okay, It's just a vehicle to get to that point. That's what the teaching is. It's a guide. But your goal is to have the child learn. Okay, so now use engaging multisensory activities. Child will be more relaxed, they're happier, they'll be part of it, and they're playing. Okay, the next part is activate. Whatever you're doing, make sure you activate the brain and the, and the body. Have them be, move around, do things. Have them laughing, talking to each other, socializing. It, that is one of the most critical things when you're socializing. You feel you have a friend and you have friends and you belong. It makes you feel wonderful. And when you feel good, you'll be happy to learn. Um, R, rehearse. You can't learn anything unless you practice it and practice it and practice it. Rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. Again, playing games over and over again, you're going to learn it. We all learned how to play Monopoly. No one actually stood and gave us lessons. We played it over and over and over again. Um, that's the goal of the card games, the ones who are using them. Because every game you can play over 10 different Games with one deck you can play over 10 different games. And the children select the game, so it empowers them, and then they're playing again, and they're playing again. Whether you're using our stuff, or you make your own, or you, you get free things, whatever it is, keep you be cognizant, is this engaging the child, or are they learning from it? Now you'll know if they actually are learning from it, and what, you, what happens here you now have to look to see if there's neural change, and you know by doing the assessment again. Okay? The assessment will, you'll look and you'll now say, wow, okay, they know all the letters now. Now they know all the um, all their vowels. I, I am ready now to move on to one syllable words. Or you might say, no, he's missing an awful lot of these vowels. Let me go back and let's Let's go over this again. Let's, maybe we'll play the games differently. Maybe I'll only use half a deck. He, he needs less. Many children are given too much too fast, and they can't process it. So if you see they're not learning, you can go back, do what you've been doing, give them less. Because most people learn things in chunks of threes, fours, and fives. That's why you zip code the five digits. <laughs> because... The people who made up your zip codes and made up social security numbers and phone numbers and all your credit cards, go and look at them. They're in chunks, all the numbers, threes, fours, and fives. So go back and say, okay, I think this child's getting too much too fast. And, and go over it again. They'll be happy because they're playing. It's fine with them. And then you go through the whole process again, and then you do assessment again when you're all done. And usually... 
I'd say um, do an assessment. I don't not sure with other games, but I know our own card games. I usually have to three or four times that they played the game. They take like 15 minutes each. Um, they come in the next time. See what they are. See if they're still there. If they're at that same level, if they moved up, or they still need to practice a little more. Okay, now let's see. Like I'm checking because I know we have 45 minutes. <clears throat> We're now up to challenges and obstacles. Now let's say you've created this environment. You're very organized. You got your binnies, your boxes, your, your all your loose leaf books. Um, you, you know all the disabilities. You know what's happening. Child goes and learning. Okay, what what is it? You, there's challenges and obstacles. What is happening? Especially with the after school, after school, one of the big issues is absenteeism. Because there's so much competition. You have soccer practice, baseball practice, football practice, dance recitals, dance classes, swimming. There's so much going on. And so the absenteeism, it's hard to learn something an hour a month. It's not going to stay. And then you go home to practice it. Because I even know many of the schools have brought double decks so that they can send them home so they practice so they can play go fish at home or memory or crazy eights at home because the kids are like that they say oh, i'll do that i'll go and take them home because i want to play there's the problem because there's not enough time even at home many times and then it goes into bullet number three the parent involvement most of our parents are quite involved and many of them don't know hebrew and so you have to come up with a way for parents. Some schools actually have calling in parents to come in and have a card party. So they learn how to play the games. They have to learn how to play, and then they can help the child. Okay. Many of the schools are using teenagers. They're having teenagers come in and work with different groups of children. Some of the, um, some of the temples are actually paying them. Some are giving them credit, community service. Uh, it's, and train your teenagers, because if they're not trained, they will not know what to do. Tell me, you want to play this game, I want this one doing this one, this one has to do. And ha talk to them about how they speak to the children. Go back to the environment, because they'll be part of this. Okay? So, use, but, but use your 13 to 16 year olds. It's great for you, it's great for the children, and it's a wonderful thing for that age group. Finally, Undiagnosed or unreported learning disabilities. Many kids have obstacles because they have a disability and no one has diagnosed it. They've said no, they're lazy, they don't get, and the parents or the schools haven't done their homework to say, hey, this kid's been struggling for years. Something is going on. If you see something happening, talk to the parents. And see, is there something at school? Maybe, and so many parents will say, oh, yeah, they do have an IEP. I, didn't, I just meant, never mentioned that. Okay, oh, yes, no, no, my son is dyslexic. Oh, really? No, he has ADD. They don't mention it. It's very hard to teach if they don't. Um, so some are undiagnosed and others simply, they don't report it. They think you're not going to notice. So if you're the educational director and you know these things, make sure the teacher knows it. If you're the teacher and you feel something's wrong, go to your educational director and together contact the parents. And then there's going to be the things control that you can't control. <laughs> you're going to be so frustrated because no matter how much you spoke to so-and-so and that his son is never there on Sundays like the whole year, so he's only there an hour a week or two hours a week because they go skiing on the weekend, you really can't control it. And you just have to sit back and go, you know what? I'll control what I can control. You can control your lessons. You can control the environment in the classroom. Um, you can control how the children view you, how they view themselves. But you can't control what you can control. So with all this in mind, I hope you've enjoyed this. This is what we call the strong learning system. And as I said, it's basically for free. You don't have to spend thousands and thousands of dollars on this program that to go, okay, this is going to do it. This is going to change the world. They actually did research on different programs for dyslexia. As I said, I'm one of the therapists for it. So years ago, the International Dyslexia Association did research to see which program helped the most. 
And actually they found out none of them were any different than any. They were the same. It was the teacher. It was the teacher who engaged them and made them feel comfortable and safe in that classroom and respected. So um, that's about it. If you have any questions, we'll be more than happy to answer any questions. Okay, we do have one. Somebody just said, I have every year, I have a class of about 15 kids only. There's not much, it's a small class, but they're all at different levels. I don't really know what to do. That happens all the time in all classrooms, except if you're teaching, let's say, in a high school and you're teaching a math course or you're teaching history. Elementary school, kids are always at different reading groups and different math groups. They're different levels all the time. Um, he just goes the same. So if this happens, remember the assessment. Find out where they are. Get your teenage helpers in. Separate them. Put little groups together. Um, don't make one feel less important than the other or that, that they're not as bright as the other, but they'll feel good if they are sitting and succeeding at their level. So divide them up. There's one teacher actually who's shared with us that she's First, the first day of Hebrew school, she's having all the kids, she's separating them to play cards just with the alphabet. So it's nice and easy. So they can all play, they socialize, they're all back together. While that's happening, she's sitting at a separate table and calling one up at a time and doing the assessment. So she knows immediately where every child is. And that's what you have to do. And in one of those boxes or bins or in a basket, keep always keep a pile of paper of sheets that the kid can take, pick up if they finish early, because you always have that one before you hand everything out. They say, I'm done. They can always go up to the basket or to the bin and take out something, make it about the holiday or make it a thought-provoking question about who wrote Hatikva or something. Um, think about these things. Um, we give lessons that you can do also if you need to, you know, to know what to do with each letter or vowels or whatever we give lessons you can do for that. And I'm sure you have plenty. You've all been teaching a long time, I'm sure. You might just take your all your lessons you have and take them and separate them and children know when I finish I can go do this. I have even one class I was working with. They were making a paper chain. The whole class they were taking the prayers and, and putting them in up in order of on a paper chain. And when they finished the work, they could go over and start working on the paper chain. Be creative. And the kids will love it. Uh, and you'll love it because it'll help organize you. I apologize, but I think we ran out of time. And um, I just want to thank you all again. And if you have any questions or anything, please, please go to HebrewSchoolFun.com and just type in questions you have. If you, um, you want to download any of these things that we talked about today, it's hebrewschoolfund.com slash pages slash downloads. And it's right there in front of you for the people who maybe it's, you can't see the PowerPoint because that happens. Again, you go to hebrewschoolfund.com slash pages slash downloads. I thank you all for coming here. Have a wonderful, wonderful year. And stay touched. Keep looking at the eBlast because in September we're having our next webinar for free. And this one is called Getting Ready for the Holidays. I hope to see you then. Thank you.